Hi, my name is Thomas Schneider. I want to talk about later 1960s and 1970s period Cologne by flashing up some slides, mainly newspaper clippings. But let me start with trivia. A postcard I found on the street the other day. You will recognise the tower of Great St Martins and the dual spires of Cologne Cathedral. The fun stamp dates from 2021 and celebrates 50 years of Die Maus, the mascot adopted by our broadcaster, the Westdeutsche Rundfunk, which means the mouse was born just one year before me. Today, two years on in 2023, one needs to add five cents to send a letter to anywhere in Germany. It would not get far with this additional five pfennig postage though. The stamp dates from 1946 and is one of the first to be issued as part of the post-war Währungsreform. At the time, the standard letter rate was 20 Pfennige, equivalent to 10 Euro cent. In fact, the letter rate stayed at 20 Pfennige for 20 years, right up until 1st April 1966, when it was hiked 50% to 30 Pfennige. The rate climbed to 40 Pfennige in mid-1972, my birth year, and ended the decade at 60 Pfennige in 1979. In any case, unlike a 5 Pfennig coin, which can still be exchanged, Bundespost stamps issued prior to the European currency communalization of 1st 1st 2002 are worthless today. The German Postal Service had been privatized in 1994. End of trivia. Before browsing at Cologne Central Library for images to use in this talk, I brainstormed keywords that I associate with the period. I also asked ChatGPT for key themes which are then paraphrased. The frightening spectre on the horizon on New Year's Eve 1966 was the question, has the German Wirtschaftswunder faltered, even under its famed inventor Ludwig Erhard at the helm as West Germany's second Bundeskanzler, after Konrad Adenauer quit after 14 years in 1963? Indeed, there was an uneasy feeling that Germany had reached the limits of growth no longer even able to service the costs of US troops stationed on its territory to protect against the Soviet. Coal mines in the Ruhrgebiet were beginning to close, putting German dads out of work, and the baby boomer generation had begun to mull the sustainability of the soziale Marktwirtschaft system and their future chances within it, faced with rising social inequality, environmental pollution, resource exploitation, imperialist proxy wars and, of course, the Cold War arms race. For a post-war generation privileged to have grown up in relative comfort and steadily increasing wealth, there seemed the possibility of more individual freedom, exploration and risk-taking, a break with the dull uniformity of their parent society, as reflected in the election slogan No Experiments, Konrad Adenauer. Believe it or not, this had won the Conservatives a nationwide absolute parliamentary majority in 1957 and, even in 1965, sounded appealing in Adenauer's native Cologne. Initial protests were triggered by practical financial concerns, a hike in the cost of local public transport, just like the 50% jump in postal rates mentioned in relation to the opening slide. On 24th October 1966, Cologne's inner city trams were brought to a standstill mostly by students. The riots escalated, causing property damage and resulting in 21 police arrests. Protesters wielded umbrellas against the rain and to avoid identification, giving rise to the term Regenschirmdemonstration. Student Union Chairman Klaus Lepple, who had called for the unapproved demonstration, spent a night in a police cell and was sued, though later acquitted. The flower power years saw a blossoming of culture and counterculture in Cologne. On the one hand, avant-garde exhibits opened their doors, such as the Kunstverein, forerunner of the Art Cologne. On the other, displays of classical Roman sculptures. Hippies preached free love and vented anti-war sentiments. A state funeral for Konrad Adenauer was staged, against his wishes, at the Dome in April 1967 and in May-June 1967, the Shah of Iran came on a visit to Germany, including to Cologne, to be made an honorary citizen. 
It was, in fact, during the visit of the Shah to Berlin a few days earlier, on 2nd June 1967, a demonstration took place against allegedly paid-off Persian cheerleaders. The student Benno Ornazog was shot by a policeman. This made him an instant martyr for the APO, the self-professed outer parliamentarian opposition, which had sprung up in response to the alleged cessation of real democratic parliamentary debate under the ruling Grand Coalition of CDU, CSU and SPD, i.e. Germany's left and right political parties united in government after December 1966. Protesters' particular ire was direct against the Notstandsgesetze, the suspension of basic human rights in emergency situations, albeit with statutory limitations. The legislation, in the pipeline for years, was pushed as essential by the Grand Coalition, now they held the two-thirds majority in Parliament necessary for the constitutional change. Many students, but also professors and intellectuals, viewed this development critically particularly given Germany's experience with paragraph 48 of the Weimar Constitution. Citizens took to the streets to protest across the country. Ultimately, the fatal events of 2nd June split the movement. The moderate majority heeded student leader Rudi Dutschke's call for a long march through the institutions, whilst a radical underground fringe assembled to form the RAF, the Red Army faction that spread anti-establishment terror across Germany during the 1970s. Student demands in Cologne, however, mainly focused on increased administrative participation at university level in the face of pending high school reforms. Lists were drawn up of professors for and against a student takeover of the university administration. Protests at the university climax in a student strike and a symbolic renaming of the university in honour of Communist First Lady Rosa Luxemburg, one day after the German Parliament enacted the Nordstand legislation. Infamously, 31st May 1968 saw the confrontation of 150 to 200 leftists by other students of the university who sprayed the barricades erected by the protesters with water from a fire main hose. The day saw Professor Rubin, renowned Byzantine specialist and far-right eccentric entered the fray with what some termed a flamethrower, in fact a burning lamp that runs on gas. The combative professor returned in the afternoon to hurl bags of tar-like substance against the freshly painted red letters, defacing the rechristened university entrance main facade. University officials quickly distanced themselves from the actions of a mad professor. 80% of lectures were held as usual the following day. By the end of the second evening, barricades were voluntarily dismantled. Truth be told, the rectors of the university had long pursued de-escalatory dialogue with the student body. For example, Werner Scheid, renowned psychologist and rector of 1966-67, took a libertine view towards the private pursuits of his students, earning him some press ridicule. Nonetheless, the city saw a wave of anti-Americanism against the wars being fought in Indochina. These protests cast a critical spotlight on the proportionality of police tactics against demonstrators, though the photos look decidedly tame compared to what we have become accustomed to today. Press voices caricatured the emergency laws as an ostentatiously tame monster lurking at the door. But sympathy for self-proclaimed revolutionaries amongst the populace was low. The conservative press decried them as revoluzas, as sheltered brats and unemployed rebels without a cause, whilst the man in the street just got on with the job despite higher costs of living. Expanding our picture of turn of the decade Cologne, I selected several other events of lasting impact. In 1969, City planning was computerized with the Siemens system 4004-05. We see the population divided into Catholics, Protestants, others and foreigners. Notice that the majority was aged between 25 and 30, young compared to the mean today, and now old age pensioners. Also note the predominance of foreign men over foreign women, guest workers invited to Cologne to work, mostly in its factories. Not everyone stayed, but many did ultimately move out of company dormitories, bring over their families and going on to raise their children. They not only accumulate much of the city's current wealth, but made it into a vibrant, cosmopolitan and tolerant place. 
1970 saw the opening of high rises, the familiar university tower block, and the beautiful view of the river from the Colonia Tower across from Mülheim, where I live. The bear moths still stand. But I am happy to say that despite the euphoria, Cologne has managed to mostly contain its sky-high fantasies. To this day, the heart of the city remains mostly a five-story affair. More charmingly, Cologne managed to retain a green belt and built itself a reputation for thoughtful gardening, not least when it hosted in 1971, for the second time at the same venue, the Bundesgarten Short, uh, short the Buga Bundesgarten Schau, the National Gardening Exhibition on the Rhine Meadows, just adjacent to its Messe, the World's Fair Permanent Building Complex. Cologne was also decidedly late constructing its metro, choosing instead to keep much of its tram network above ground. The first underground line opened only in 1968. But the city could not escape the own car dream. Ugly highways scarred the cityscape, though parts are now below ground. Traffic often came to a standstill. Infrastructure on historic ground can hardly keep up with car mania. The photo shows the car-free Sunday, introduced by government as a necessity to conserve valuable oil in the face of OPEC quota restrictions. Surprisingly, this was welcomed as a breath of fresh air by many citizens, a chance to get back on your bike. Less gloriously, Cologne also witnessed Germany's first post-World War II banking bust. A run on the bank ensued when the Herstadt private bank collapsed in 1974 after overextending itself on US dollar foreign exchange bets. Diligent savers had to wait many years for the compensation and many never fully recovered their deposits. Unlike today, there was no state-sponsored rescue. Irrational exuberance of a few rogues aside, the collapse can be linked to the first oil shock and the end of the Bretton Woods system of fixed exchange rates. Naturally, Cologne is particularly proud of inventing own brands, Kölsch Music. Heavyweights include the Black Fuss and Flo the Cologne. Masters of the local dialect, the former sang live just the other day. We notice allusions to the tragic Munich Olympics of 1972 and the football fever that grabbed Germany in 1974. Wolf Biermann is seen performing to a packed Sportshalle on 13th November 1976, three days before being expelled from his adopted home, East Germany. I also smuggled a 1979 post of the Green Party into this collage. The 1970s saw an evolution of APO elements towards the political mainstream. Guiding themes were ecological awareness, social inclusion, grassroots democracy and opposition to the use of force. The Greens allied themselves with the anti-nuclear and anti-war movements. But no review of the period could be complete without a brief look at the trade and political integration that played such a central role in achieving peaceful economic growth and generate value for all of Europe. Founded amid the economic miracle of the 1950s, and certainly contributing to it within the then crucial remit of steel and coal, 1968 was also the year that a full European customs union became a reality. Tariffs disappeared overnight between the six core member states of France, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Belgium and Luxembourg. 1973 saw this union enlarged to welcome the United Kingdom, Ireland and Denmark. Apart from the free movement of goods, the free movement of people played a significant part in invigorating our economies and furthering understanding. Unity also paid dividends in terms of European export success. The 1970s closed with the first European parliamentary elections, as well as the election of Margaret Thatcher to lead Britain. Here, the jury is invariably out as to whether this last step was for the better. Whilst no one doubts the importance of the European Commission, a majority in the UK decided, by popular vote, to retain Britain's state sovereignty. There is a common perception that the bureaucracy of Europe adds surprisingly little value. Indeed, 
even within Germany, it may be debated whether consolidation of 16 Länder bureaucracy and a streamlining of federal government could not bring more benefits and further extension of the European Parliament overhead. Anyway, just for reference, here are the sources I consulted to obtain the visual material for this presentation. I thoroughly recommend thumbing through the originals. There is so much more to discover.